Hey, and welcome to Winning Conversations. Today, Dan and I had an opportunity to sit down with the one and only Eric Deaton. His life is a very cool story of lots of successes, um, whether it's in athletics or ministry or business, just about everything he touches it has God's favor on it. But that didn't come automatically. You get to hear the story of a man who is authentic and humble and really trusts God all along the way. So without any further ado, let's jump into our conversation. Well, hello. What's up, guys? We <laughs> are here. Oh, my gosh. You guys didn't hear there was a drum roll while this thing was starting. <laughs> the, the anticipation of this is immense. Um, this is Daniel, clearly. Hey. hey, it's Tanya. How are you, Eric? Great. Everything's great. So I know you the least. <laughs> so I I want to ask some kind of like, like baseline questions that I think I don't know the answer to, so I'm really curious. About. I'm not telling you my height or weight, Dan. All right. Well, then guess what? This podcast is over. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like so I know you were an athlete growing up, right? That that someone a rumor had told me that at some point in time you had done some athletic stuff. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to give you like, what was your growing up high school like athletic sports? Like, was that a priority for you, or what was going on with that? I think I had a baseball bat in my hand on my first birthday. <laughs> what was the sport? Is it baseball was your sport? Baseball was, and uh, also basketball. But I, I played every sport, pretty much any sport that I could play, I played. I was in a volleyball league. I bowled. I played ping pong. I got, right, <laughs> I got some stories about ping pong, by the way. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but mostly I, <laughs> I excelled at baseball and basketball. Now, when I was like, I'd say, 15 years old, I was throwing the ball 84 miles an hour pitching. Is that good? Holy. That's good I think that's for a 15 fast, year Dan. old. Yeah. I don't, and, I don't and know baseball. so, uh, well, anyway, I, my dad, I was going out to play football, backyard football. My dad told me, don't go, don't play. And um, so I went anyway, and I, a kid tackled me, and I came down on my pitching shoulder, and it snapped, and I never pitched again. So that, that was going into my junior year in high school. And uh, so then I kind of switched my focus to basketball. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I ended up getting a full scholarship offer from Lee University in basketball where um, my, my mom and dad had both attended in Cleveland, Tennessee. And it was great. Had a great experience there. And uh, But I, I played in high school, too. And we won a state championship in high school. Uh, All my right freshman now. year, won a state championship. And I started, I think I – I did pretty well in the semifinal. One game I had 35 points, and another game I had 28 points, I think, in the state finals. Off the bench or? Just I started. <laughs> just and then, uh, and then in college, my sophomore year, we won the national championship. For real? So, yeah. So I've got a lot of uh, great experiences with sports. And, That's awesome. And, uh, you know, just love sports growing up. Ah, oh, sweet. Was there any sport that you didn't excel at for any reason? Uh... Can I say no? I mean, <laughs> no, you just were athlete. No, absolutely. I mean, people I just, who are I liked, athletic. I liked sports. I liked competition. You know, it was just if we all if we got together, we were playing backyard football or backyard baseball. You know. Now during this time, I mean, again, so how much is faith a part of your life during this? Or did you grow up in a house of faith? I grew up in church. Uh, Dad was on staff at the church. Uh, Mom worked for the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, I won't hold that against you. <laughs> and so dad started as the music minister at the church. And then he moved into like a business administrator role. And so I got saved when I was five years old. And I remember it was Easter Sunday. And the pastor uh, from the front said, is any, anyone here, you're not born again. You never invited Jesus to be in your life. And so I, I raised my hand as a five-year-old boy, not knowing if he could see me. I had my eyes closed, you know, raised, raised my hand up and. Well, mom saw me, raised my hand, and so she walked me down to the front. And there was probably 300 people in there, and we were sitting. I remember we were sitting, I think, on the back row. And um, so she walked me down the front, and I accepted the Lord. And uh, 1979, Easter Sunday. And uh, then when I was eight years old, eight or nine years old, there was an evangelist that came to town, and he had an altar call for those being filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking other tongues. And so I went down for that. And I remember 
him laying hands on me and I immediately began to speak in tongues and then I fell down under the power of God. And while I was down, I, I saw probably down for 30 minutes. And I saw my, the, you know, my life, like visions of my life. And, and, uh, so my dad came and picked me up off the floor. And, uh, so later he asked me, you know, what, what, what did you see or what did you experience? I said, Dad, I'm going to be a preacher. And so this was me at a young what? at a young age, you know, at twelve. Eight. I was eight or nine. Eight, I'm sorry, 12. I was eight or nine years old. Yeah. Wow. And so I said, I'm going to be a preacher. Well, after that, I just kind of buried that way down, and and sports was really what I pursued. And so I didn't bring that up again. I didn't really pursue it, although I had a heart for God. And so like we had early morning prayer at the church every, I think it was every Friday, 6 a.m. And I would get up, uh, get myself up and go with my dad as a teenager to the early morning prayer. And then uh, there was also early morning basketball. So some guys would go to the prayer and then go do basketball. And so I would, you know, I had a heart for God. You know, I grew up in the youth group and did all the youth group stuff and and then, you know, this college was a Christian college, so that kind of fit into uh, where I was headed. But I didn't, like, say, I'm going to, I didn't keep saying, I'm going to be a preacher one day. I'm going to be a preacher. It was, hey, I'm going to play professional baseball or whatever. So when when my shoulder, uh, when I got the news, I, you know, that, that, that I couldn't, it, it was over for me there. That was, that was pretty crushing. And so... Um, Anyway, went on to college. They would have chapel at college, and you were required <laughs> to make so many chapel services. So if there were, it was Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sunday nights. So there were 12 chapel services in a month, and you had to make nine of them. Okay, wow. so nine to 12. So where I was, I was like planning which three I would miss, mm -hmm. you know? And then, <laughs> and then when, when Nikki, when I met her and you can talk, if you want to talk about that, we can later, but when I met her, she was a chapel usher. And so what the ushers do would, would, they would scan your badge, which checks you in to chapel. So I'd be like, here, take my badge and, and, uh, you know, scan it for me. So I don't have to go. And she said, I'm not doing that for you. I'm like, what? Praise the Lord. Like, like you're, you're I, my. You're my yeah. girlfriend. You're, you know, you're supposed to get those kinds of privileges. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of where I was uh, <laughs> as a Christian. I love that. Like, and I sat, I sat in the balcony, like, boom, way up in the balcony. And they would have these altar calls. And I was like, you know, the cool one sitting there. I said, I'm not going down. And I, I would totally resist every altar call because – the people that I saw going down there, you know, were people that when they left, they were cussing right, right out of the building, you know. So I thought, well, I'm not going down there. And besides, and here's what I would say. If I go down to that altar, God may ask me to go to Africa or something. In my <laughs> mind, I would say that in my mind. And to me, that was so, like, pun so much, like, it's punishment. Right. Like, you know. Plus, I don't want to be associated with these other people. You know, I'm a, I'm the cool athlete sitting up in the top of the balcony and and uh, kind of make fun of everybody type of deal. <laughs> that was entirely foreshadowing for where your life was about to go, yeah. right? And so, uh, so anyway, we graduate college, and Nikki and I get married right out of college. Well, I graduated, and we get married. She has another year, and I've you know I find a, a job with a buddy of mine who was selling cell phones. This is 1996. Oh, I know you. The cell phones in 1996 was like a big bag. Mm -hmm. Okay. You, you bought it, you use it for emergencies only because it was like 15 bucks a minute or something crazy, some crazy. Uh, so anyway, they started coming out with these little flip phones and handheld phones. So cell phones were hot. So I graduated in, uh, in, in July, and I immediately get a job. Well, uh, we'd go sit at a mall with a kiosk, and I would sell cell phones and make two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand bucks in a month right out of 
college and I'm thinking this isn't bad, Mm -mm. you know, for a communications major who was specializing in being in TV broadcast. Really? So, um, so I get through this and then finally Nikki graduates and I've been doing good in sales and things like that. So we moved to Birmingham, Alabama from Cleveland, Tennessee. And I decide, okay, I'm going to pursue my education now. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go apply to a TV station. And, uh, cause you know, I was the kid when ESPN came out and I remember my dad saying, Hey son, they're coming out with a, a all sports network, you know? And I was like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> so I, I think I'm going to be an ESPN sportscaster broadcaster. And, uh, so I go apply at the local, I don't remember if it was the NBC or CBS affiliate station in Birmingham, Alabama. So I get to the interview and they say, they tell me, you know, I see you major in communications and all this and, and, uh, specialize in TV broadcasting. And, but we'll have you, I have, you know, that how you get started is you're going to come in, you're going to hold the cables. Uh, you're going to clean the restrooms. Uh, if the backup reporter doesn't show up or can't be somewhere, then we might send you out, you know? And I was like, okay, so what does this pay? 18,000 was what it was going to pay. Well, I was, I was making three, four, five, six thousand $6,000 a month selling cell phones. So I thought I'm going to take a huge step backwards. You know, if I go, if I pursue this and it doesn't sound like I'm going to get right in, like, like I had hoped, you know, whatever. So I just got a sell another sales job and, uh, it was selling long distance when the bell companies were just breaking up. And so I did that for a while and absolutely hated it. Sounds it was, exciting. What are you talking about? <laughs> it was such, it was like, I'm bored telling the story. I'm reconsidering was, this entire day. <laughs> but like, so every morning I got up and I had knots in my stomach. Wow. I, did, I didn't want to go to work, you know? So there came to a, a point where I know I wasn't being successful because I just didn't like this. And, but the Lord spoke to me and he said, if you're not faithful in this, then I can't move you on to something else. And I remember that, like it was, it was such, so impactful to me. I said, well, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? I want you to go in. I want you to have a good attitude and I want you to get yourself organized and you go and you really put your all into this. Cause I wasn't, you know, so I did that. And then I started making sales quotas and it wasn't two months after making two months of sales quota that he moved me into the job that I'm in right now, still doing my own business fundraising for high school athletics. And so, uh, but, but I remember that, that he said to me, if you're not faithful in this, then I can't move you on. And so I remember Alabama heat going out in my little Honda CRX hatchback. I don't know if you remember those. Come on now. 1989 Honda CRX hatchback. Uh, stick shift and I didn't have air conditioning and I had to wear a shirt and tie to work. And I was just, I was sweat going to get out of the car, go call on 27 businesses, get shut down. Most of the time, just getting back in the car, sweat. I would go home. Literally my, my clothes would be drenched, but you know, it all, it all trained me for that next step that I, that I took. So that's a little brief history of. That is great. Oh. Great. I mean, it sounds like God took business, which was uh, maybe a gifting. You can talk more about that and sports and brought them together into what you currently do now, right? Yeah. How did that all work? Well, you know, in sports, you learn competition and being competitive. You learn teamwork. Um, You learn how to not give up. That's one thing that my parents taught me. You know, uh, if we're going to start something, we're not going to quit. So if you want to do this, that's fine. We'll let you do it, but you're not going to quit. And so all that, all that teaches you are all life lessons so that when you get into the real world, if you have 60 applicants for one job, what is that? A competition. Yeah. Somebody's going to win that, you know, one, one person's going to win that job. And, and so there's other competitors out there. Somebody's going to win that account. You know? And so I just, 
I tried to, you know, when I learned to, um, when we were in Birmingham, we had, uh, I don't know if you were in that business meeting that we did, but Wade Lombard came in and spoke. Well, his dad, Wayne and Donna were our Sunday school teachers there in Birmingham. And they taught us prosperity and how to give and, um, business principles kind of took us under their wing. And so that's when I started tithing and, uh, offering and, and then learning to put my faith in my business. And so, uh, I, I thank Wayne Lombard because I we lost distance for a while there, but we just recently reconnected. And you're so thankful for people like that that were influenced in your life. And and uh, so then what happened was we had our son Drew, and Nikki had given me a year because the Lord had been dealing with her about moving home and helping her dad, which was which was the pastor. He's a pastor local church, in yeah. Michigan. So when Nikki grew up word of faith, I grew up denominational, Pentecostal, s- some, some similarities and some differences. So when she came to me with that, I was having very, you know, a lot of success. I was 24 years old, making a hundred thousand. And she's saying, you need to pray about us leaving all this and moving to Michigan to help dad pastor of the church. You need to pray about this. And uh, so I just kind of dismissed it like, oh, she's just, she's just being emotional. <laughs> you know, she's just, you know, she just had a baby. Yeah. It's yeah. like, so I'm like, uh, you know, nobody does this. I tell, I told her nobody does that. Nobody, nobody leaves a good job and moves for a church. So a year later, and I thought, well, she'll just forget about it. A year later, she comes back and she says, well, have you prayed about it? Prayed about what? <laughs> she says, moving, moving back to Michigan, helping dad pastor. I said, um, yeah, I don't think we're supposed to. <laughs> but the Lord had been, had actually been working on my heart about it. And he had actually already spoken to me about it, but I wasn't going to tell her that. I mean, and I lied like a dog to her. No way we're supposed to move in this. And then it came to the point where she knew we were supposed to move. And the Lord had already spoken to me, but I didn't tell her that. And she came to me and she goes, well, I know we're supposed to move. And so I'm moving and I'm taking Drew and you can come if you want to. Ouch. And so (laughs) I, (laughs) knowing that the Lord had already spoken to me, you know, I, I, I I first kind of resisted to try to see how serious she was (laughs) testing the waters a bit. She is always serious, right? (laughs) And so she, she was serious. (laughs) <laughs> and so anyway, what the Lord has said to me, he said, uh, if you'll do this, if you'll make this commitment, I'll make you number one in the company. Why well, I was working for this company, why well, I'd had a, I was rookie of the year, my first year, the second year that are at, at the end of my first year, they promoted me to manager. They gave me the whole, uh, Southeast, like several States in the Southeast. And so I was like moving up really fast. And, um, so I had made like $160,000 in my third year there. And so that's what I was thinking the whole time is I'm, I just made $160,000. This doesn't just, so the Lord says, if you'll do this, I'll make sure you don't go backwards and I'll make you number one in the company. Well, I went up there in the first year in Michigan. I did the same amount of sales that I had done in my third year in Alabama. And then my second year in Michigan, I was the, uh, number one manager in the company Wow! Uh, of the team that I managed. So the Lord held true to his deal. But, but what I, what I uh, realized when I got there is once I got over this resistance, because I resisted this majorly was that I had a call on my life and this this prophet came in, guest speaker came in, and he just read my mail. He said, you come up here. I've been there like six months. He said, you come up. And he just read my mail saying, when you were eight or nine years old, you had an experience with God. That's what I just talk, talked right, about. Right. Well, I think I had buried that way down. I, t- I have never told anybody that. And um, so he went on, he said, and I see hill tracks in the sand leading all the way to 
to Quincy, Michigan, just dragging you, just dragging you. And that's, that's what happened, you know? And he said, but the Lord was laughing all the way, you know, because, because God knew what was ahead. And so he said, I decree you, you have a call to preach the gospel and that's going to be your life's work. Basically in a nutshell. And that's when I just, you know, started going deeper in my relationship with the Lord. I'd been really shallow as a Christian. It was, you know, God was part of my life. Uh, church was a part of my life, but it wasn't the relationship with him. That was a deep relationship that I, that I should have been pursuing. And that's one of the things he said, you know, he said, um, you know, every time you have, there's an altar call, you're touched, but you're not, you're not pursuing this. Like you're not chasing God. You're not chasing the call. And he was a so right. I had been running this all these years and never brought that up since I was eight or nine years old. And now God was bringing back everything, you know, to, to my remembrance. So Nikki's dad is a great pastor, Bible teacher, and I learned so much. So, you know, I led praise and worship for, um, before we left, it was 18 years. We went in the prisons for 16 years. We we're going into the local high schools, doing Bible school, uh, Bible studies. And so all this time, you know, God was training me and, and teaching me. And, you know, there's just, so, so you asked, well, what your early years, that was it is, is, you know, and, and I want to encourage those out there too, that there's always a, another level that God wants to take you. And if you'll dare to go there and dare to step out into things that, it may not be a move, a move drastically across the country, and we've done that twice now. But there's things that God will, you know, just tap people's hearts and say, there's more for you here, there's more for you. And on the other side of that is just a wonderful life that God has that people have only dreamed about. And, you know, we've experienced that, you know, the goodness of God, his faithfulness. When that when that transition that just makes me question when that transition happened from going from this is just part of who I am to I'm sold entirely out to the Lord, what what changed in your day to day walk? What was what was your lifestyle like? That transition that really helped open up some of that favor that's on your life. Well, I think first of all is you have to surround yourself with people that are of like faith. And so that's probably the biggest uh, hurdle for someone that makes a change like that and wants to go deeper. Because if you <laughs> if you hang with turkeys, you're gonna be a turkey, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but if you want to soar with the eagles, you know. And so there were a lot of of people that I had that I would have been so called friends that I had to pull back from and. They would question, and they would they would kind of ridicule and kind of make, "What'd you get religion?" You know, and it, it wasn't religion; it was, you know, this was real. You know, it was no longer religion. That's what I used to have <laughs> was a religion, but now it was this. This is personal, and um, and so you just the Bible says that you know bad company corrupts good morals, and so that was really the first thing that I had to do was um, change those relationships. Play aside relationships. Yeah. That's powerful. So that's awesome. Like, so you're in Michigan, like the Lord blesses you with your work. Obviously I'm assuming that Nikki wasn't giving you ultimatums anymore <laughs> about, <laughs> about moving, <laughs> but now you come to Texas. So you end up in Crowley, Texas. And yeah. How'd that happen? Yeah. Like, how does that, how does that work? So I, I started going to my basement in, in Michigan. You have basements and we had a, a stove uh, fire thing and it would blow heat and take pellets. And so I go to sit by that every morning and I would pray in the Holy spirit. And I started doing that more and more and more and more. Well, the more I did it, the, the more I would uh, see visions of myself doing certain things in the ministry. And so Finally, I said to the Lord, you got to stop showing me this stuff because I would get so fired up, you know, and I would see this stuff 
and I would feel God's presence and it was just awesome, all this, but then I would be frustrated at the same time. And so I said, Lord, why are you showing me? You got to stop showing me this. Why are you showing me that? He said, I'm showing you the stuff that I showed you when you were eight or nine years old. Wow. So he was bringing all of that back. Well, I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't know, you know, that the, I couldn't remember that that's all the stuff I had seen and things. And so we, it was just, all I could describe it as is this stirring in our hearts uh, it wasn't that we weren't doing ministry, we were doing it. And it wasn't that we were discontent because I would check myself, check my motives, and, and we were serving, we were doing whatever it took to help, you know, the man of God with the vision that God had given him. And so I, I never had to feel led when I was asked to do something. I always laugh when people say, well, let me pray about it. <laughs> so you need to pray about serving. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cause we just did everything that we, you know, we could do, but, um, but it, you know, when, then I met Ju Pastor Justin and uh, Nikki and I did at Dr. Savell's presence cabinet and we just kind of hit it off. And so I think, it was nice for them to have friends that weren't in the church because they could share things that they probably wouldn't share with someone that went to the church. And so we prayed for each other. And then they said, Hey, do y'all want to go on vacation with us? And, uh, this is like 2017. So we went to Yosemite. Well, the place we stayed at, uh, nice lodge. Well, we went to go mountain hiking, saw the waterfalls, beautiful, beautiful, everything. We came back, the road was blocked and we're like, our hotel's this way. You can't go. There's a fire right behind your hotel. Oh, I remember mm. this. And so <clears throat> we couldn't get back. And so we we tracked four hours around the mountain. And we all got along. We didn't fight. And we stopped at a CVS, bought uh, shaving cream, toothpaste, toothbrush, and underwear. <laughs> And we got across the uh, around the other side of the mountain and we got a call. They said, we're going to give you 10 minutes at 10 o'clock in the morning to come get your stuff and get out. So anyway, on that trip, they said, Hey, we're going to Africa next year. We, do y'all want to go with us? And about three years before that, I had gotten up in front of our church in Michigan and said, Nikki and I are going to Africa. We don't know how we don't know when, but we're going to go. And it was just a, it was a faith thing for me that I, that I needed to, cause I, cause it was just in my heart. I couldn't get rid of it. Well, of course that was God again, bringing up stuff from when I was a kid. Well, one lady in church went and got this book on Africa and gave it to us and say, if you're going to Africa, you will start reading up on Africa. And so we did, you know, Aww, it had all the sweet. cities and the, and the, 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 uh, the, uh, sites that you can see and all this. So I said, well, you're asking, I said, so you're asking us a year in advance to go to Africa with you? I was like, let me check my schedule. I mean, like, <laughs> how could you, you know, who plans a year in advance, except for maybe your, you, she's my your, wife, your wife, yep. but besides her, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but so when we went to Africa and just, I mean, I'm talking about, we had amazing, uh, services and, and an amazing time over there. And, I just knew when we came back that we were supposed to leave uh, where we were and step out in faith. And we had, you know, three open doors. And a couple of years prior to that, we had had a, uh, Nikki's dad actually said, there's three doors I see open to you, you know, but one of them is of me. And um, so anyway, one of those was here. And but we had never had a conversation with Dr. Savell. You know, we were obviously friends with Pastor Justin and that. And um, we were partners with Dr. Savell in the President's Cabinet, which is a kind of like a mission support group. And so um, one day we just said, let's, we're, we have to, we have to leave. And, and it was, you know, two months later we were here. And so after we moved, Dr. Savell came to us, said, Hey, I want to meet with you guys. And I don't want to tell all the particulars of what that conversation was, but basically it was, you know, we'd like to bring you on 
and in various roles and, and things and and uh which was a dream for me because I he was one of the first word of faith preachers that I would buy all his CD you know, tapes at the time, CDs, uh VHS, DVDs. I'm talking about. And so when I'd go on the road and, and do sales and stuff, that's you know, I was listening to a lot of his stuff. So it's because of Nikki's dad that I was introduced to, you know, other word of faith preachers, but I particularly connected with him because he, he used a lot of sports analogies and talked a lot about right. winning and never quitting and never giving up. And I just, I just loved, you know, well, it kind of goes back to what you said when you kind of got sold out for the Lord, like the relationships really do make a difference. So like your relationship with pastor Justin and Annette really brought your hearts together. And then your connection with Dr. Seville and hearing him, the anointing on his life as it relates to preaching and stuff. It's like the Lord put those pieces together. You need, you need good teaching. You need solid friendships and you need to be in the will of God. And it's like, he, he drew those all here to Texas. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because, uh, we, t we talk about faith, but like, I'm a person that I don't really like change. I don't know anybody really likes change, but like we've lived in three homes Nikki and I have only lived in three homes our whole our whole life together. So that tells you like this is a huge step of faith. But what I've learned through all of it is that, you know, you take a step of faith and then God shows you the next step. And then there's another step. And I would love that he would just show us the whole plan. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, lay it all out. But that's not how it is sometimes. And but there, that's why I, I love Dr. Spell's team, Adventures in Faith. It has truly been an adventure in faith. And it's neat to see, going back, Tanya, to what you were saying about how God will orchestrate things and there's pieces of the puzzle that he'll put in. There's a missing piece. Oh, there it is. And he plugs it right in. And it's just God's good. This is a question I think is an awesome question that I, I kind of wish we'd ask some others, but I'm, I'm glad we're here to ask it with you, is is what do you wish people understood about the Word, the Lord, the church that you see is missing? Yeah, and it, it's tough what I think uh, might be tough for some people to hear what I'm going to say, but there's two things that I see is there the people that there has been a Word movement you could say where the word's been taught, there was revelation and things and people know the word. And so when you have knowledge of something, uh, the Bible says knowledge in itself puffs up. And so I think there's a lot of people that because they know the word think that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so what I see lacking is in part is some humility in the body of Christ um, where you come in and you go, Hey, I don't know everything. And I, and I, I want to be open and hear the word today. And even though I've heard that scripture, there's something there that God can through the Holy spirit can give me revelation of to help me do it. You know, James talks about corresponding action with your faith and you can show that you have faith by your corresponding action. And so that's one thing I would say, you know, it says in, that if my people would humble themselves, you know, and pray. So I, I think that's a huge thing with God. And he exalts, resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I, I, I see that being a huge thing in the, in the body of Christ. And the second thing I would say is, it's Jesus said that in the end times, that because of lawlessness, that the love of many would grow cold. And the love he's talking about is the love of God. So it's agape is the word that's used. It's, it's the God kind of love you can only have if you're a Christian. And so he's talking about that because Christians will just choose to do whatever they want, um, that the love in them would begin to grow cold. And, and so then you kind of see that in their actions and, and, um, coupled with they think they're doing the word. And so that can create for a cold environment, you know, and, and, and I believe that that's changing now.
because, you know, I got back from Australia, Australia, people were hungry. I'm starting to really, really see that. And our church here at heritage is there's a hunger for the word, you know, I'm waiting to see Wednesday night church fill up. Uh, and, and that's my prayer is that people will be hungry. They don't want to miss a service. Um, everybody works on Wednesday, you know, everybody's tired, but come in faith, you know, and, and, uh, People showing up is an act of love because if someone's missing, I say, you know, I miss that person there tonight, you know, and <clears throat> it's easy to watch at home, but there's something about coming and gathering with the saints. There's effort there, which means there's faith there and there's love there. And so those two things I see, but, but I, I believe, you know, we're headed into a, a time where people are getting hungry again. And which means that if they're hungry, they're saying, I don't have it all. I want more of God. So their soil of their heart is softening so that the word can take effect and you know produce in their life. I think that's great. That's great. Eric, you are a champion in sports. You're a champion in business. And the, the logo of our house, kind of like the theme of where we go with everything, is making winners in life. That's what you really are. That's why we're honored to have you on our show. But I want to know what does that statement mean to you when you hear it? in relation to your life experience, what is making a winner in life mean? Well, I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> it's nice. Those are nice it's words. True. Yeah, those I are only nice say words. true things. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say, and this isn't some, uh, this isn't some false humility is that there's a lot of people with talents and gifts and things. But for me, it's just, you know, I would pray before every game, Lord, help, help me do my best for your glory. I just believe it's been God's grace on me through sports and uh, in, in understanding the principles of the word and putting them into practice. And I would just say that the word works. And if you'll, if you'll understand the word and put it into practice in your life, then it'll work for you the same as it's worked for me because God's no respecter of persons. And that's what's so great about him and his word is that he's faithful and he can take somebody that I consider myself average talent wise, but he can take someone like me that's average talent wise and cause them to excel because of his grace and, you know, the anointing and, uh, and the call. So the word works. And so if you, if you'll work the word, it'll work for you. This was awesome. Like this was so fun. This is, again, these are one of the conversations that it's like, why like, I started this like this is why I agree to it like I love this like having conversations with people that I just don't get to have and this is a great conversation so thank you so much we'll put the show note in the show notes um, I would love to have some of the the message you had from Wednesday services when you yeah, were here yeah we'll link them I think those that yeah. would be amazing I think for people listening to this like there is a there is some amazing soil on Wednesdays that people don't if we're missing out you're missing out that's all there is to it like Wednesdays are awesome so uh, thank you for plugging that in. That's all. That's great. And, uh, thank you so much for being here. This was so much fun. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>